Good evening and welcome to the uh, special meeting on March 30th, 2020 of the Foxborough School Committee. Uh, we're here in the uh, gala room at Town Hall. We are spread out and joining us via remote participation are Brent Ruder and Rob Canfield. Um, we are going to open again with the COVID-19 update from Dr. Bairdos and I thought we'd stay with the same format as we used last week and let Dr. Bairdos and, and Dr. Mello get all the way through the update and then we will ask some questions if that's okay with the committee. We do have one open public comment um, that came in via email that I'll also read after the update. Dr. Bairdos? Sure. So it's been two, year, two years, well it seems like, like it's it. been two years. <laughs> it does feel like it's, it's been, been two, two years. <laughs> it's been two weeks. It's um, a, we've only been uh, away from one another for a week and a yes. lot has happened in Lived the week. a lot of life, so. yes. Mm -hmm. That's right, and I, I actually wrote down a lot of my thoughts here this evening because I wanted to make sure that I, I didn't for, forget um, some important points, but it has been two weeks, but a lot has taken place in the last two weeks, and we've continued to place our highest priority on the importance of our social emotional learning of our students and their mental health and well-being and their families and the students and, and staff during this time, which has really proved to be so challenging and will continue to be with our extended closure. But I have to say that I am so incredibly proud of this community. Yes of our administrators, of our teachers, of our staff. The amount of work that they've done behind the curtain, if you will, has really been quite extraordinarily um, impressive in such a short amount of time. They've continued to collaborate through multiple virtual meetings to the point to where you lose count of how many of those. But to see the work that they're doing collaboratively with each other across the district, again, it, it really exemplifies the strong community that we have here in Foxborough and the commitment of our educators for our, our students. Um, I've heard directly from parents of the positive impact that teachers have had with their students and the work that has gone behind and the appreciation for them. Our food service department has con continued to provide um, food for our families in need. You'll hear a little bit in a few minutes about how that will be expanding. And then at the same time, we have continued to work and share additional resources like with the uh, Foxborough YMCA, and we're really appreciative of their efforts of, as well. I couldn't help but really stop and reflect in these last couple of weeks on many things. And being a parent myself of four children, I have two high schoolers at home, I have a college student at home and one that's just graduated from college and is now working from home. So thinking about that and reflecting on what that looks like as those of us that are still trying to work as well as balancing the demands of now schooling at home, it really is, it, it's quite challenging and how we're responding to that I think is so critically important because children are watching us closely. They're watching how we respond to things. They're watching how we handle things and how we're really in this time of uncertainty, they look to us for guidance and safety and security. So when I think about that as a parent, as well as an educator, I mean, it really is difficult on many fronts. Many of our families might have parents that are first responders. Mm -hmm. They could have parents that are in the healthcare field or in those essential positions where they're going to work and still trying to juggle and balance the demands that we're now even putting more on top of parents with um, the shift that we'll be making and talking about this evening. So the other thing that I thought about in reflecting upon all of this is that what, what we remember most is what we have an emotional attachment to and research really clearly shows that. So if you think about a time in history a big event, many times you can think back to that and you can think who you were with, where you were and how you felt during that time. And, and I really feel that this is true for this time in our lives and how we handle that with our own students and children, they're going to think back to this time. And you know, our, our hope is that they, they feel safe, that they feel connected to their, their teachers and their community in this uncertain time. And that perhaps that when they think back upon this, they might think of times they became closer to their siblings. Although sometimes I question that in my own house at some of these days. Or perhaps they'll, they'll remember it as a time that they picked up a new hobby or learned how to cook or spent extra time with their, their parents or perhaps played a, a new game or, or something to that. And then, 
possibly they're learning how to manage their time a little differently as we are in a situation that is truly, as we've continued to say, unprecedented as far as not having school and having school at home. So we are in an unprecedented health crisis and that's causing much stress on our families. It does make it untenable for some families to focus on academics. We know that, we've heard that from some families. We recognize that some families want full online teaching and that some are saying, I'm just trying to survive. So it's really finding the balance and then continuing to put all of this in perspective as we look to change our expectations as we move forward. We know that we can't apply a traditional system on this completely untraditional situation. Um, we have a totally different purpose now, engagement, um, socio-emotionally taking care of our students and providing learning in unique ways. So just um, this past uh, Friday, I shared with you a summary, or with all of our parents, a summary timeline of what's taken place in the last two weeks and where we're going forward. We are now in week three of this closure and we're taking our guidance from the Commissioner of Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, Jeff Riley. He's provided updates um, frequently to us through calls with superintendents, assistant superintendents, and then has provided recommendations as school districts make the shift to remote learning. And that's what we've been working really, really hard on. So this week we are introducing our remote learning plan based on that guidance. When we think about that guidance that's coming from his recommendations, it's really based on guiding principles that the safety and well-being of students and staff is the top priority. The COVID-19 crisis disproportionately affects vulnerable students. We know that. We have to think about our students with equity and access who has access to the learning opportunities that we're providing. The need to con maintain connections between students and staff, we know that's paramount, and that remote learning is not synonymous with online learning, it is different. So what we wanted to share with you this evening is how remote learning is going to look in Foxborough and what we have been working really hard with all of our educators um, to be able to share with parents this week and then how it will shift from this week into next week. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Mello. Great. So our uh, Foxborough Public Schools remote learning plan was just went live right before we came to school committee meeting. So it is now accessible on our website. It was released in tandem with a Foxborough Public Schools COVID-19 web space so that parents can have a one-stop shopping for all of the assignments, resources for food, resources for internet, resources for social emotional learning, everything is packaged in one place. We were particularly thinking about parents who may have multiple children in the house at different levels and not having to go to the Ahern website and the Borough website and the high school website. Also thinking about students, older siblings who may be responsible now for managing younger siblings and making it easy for them to navigate the expectations and responsibilities and access the um, assignments of their younger siblings. So this document um, is on our COVID-19 website. You'll notice it's very big in blue. If you click into that bar right there, <clears throat> and we'll scroll down just a little bit, it'll be the first thing that comes up. And if we expand it up in the right-hand corner, you'll be able to go through the slides. Um, first and foremost, as Dr. Berto said, Regardless of whether we are in school or out of school, our top priority is always the safety and health of our students. We always know that that comes first. A lot of people like to say Maslow's before Bloom's. We wanna make sure our basic student needs are met. Um, that remains true. Although with this pivot and thinking about the guidance that we have from the commissioner, we are now working hard to not only identify alternative ways for learning in a remote sense, but also to learn that. That is not the mode of instruction that we are used to engaging in. So there is definitely a learning curve for our educators, our students, and our parents. And we are cognizant of that and trying to be sensitive to that as we ease into this. So as a result, um, as Dr. Burdos has said in the past, we have a phased plan. And this will be updated weekly. And we are proud that we are taking the same thoughtful and intentional approach to planning lessons so that we can maintain our high quality of instruction. 
we are not going to compromise on what we are, it would be really easy to just put up a bunch of worksheets and, and say, okay, everyone's busy. That's not what we want to do. We want to still engage students in things that are stimulating and things that are meaningful and authentic. We want them to be able to see their teachers. We want them to have genuine interactions. And that's really the intent of this plan. So as Dr. Berto said, there have been a lot of meetings happening and a lot of collaboration between our teams. Um, in the PowerPoint, we wanted to highlight the timeline. So we went over this at the school committee meeting last week. In week one, um, Dr. Berto's canceling, and then right after that, two, uh, a day or two later, the commissioner, I mean the governor, extending that, and then right away turning around with our first round of enrichment resources under the guidance of the commissioner. Um, week two, which we just finished living, although it did feel like year two, <laughs> as you said, um, we had our school committee meeting. And some of the key accomplishments from last week were disseminating our second round of resources, which were a little bit more granular and a little bit more aligned to the grade level and curriculum as we spoke about last week. We had completed our technology surveys. We were able to deploy laptop computers to students who didn't have um, access to any technology in the home. We had our second distribution of our weekly food staples for those who rely on our breakfast and lunch programs. And again, lots of virtual meetings between all different teacher groups. Um, as Dr. Berto said, we have the, the new guidance from the commissioner as we look to week three, knowing that we are going to have an extended closure. So with that, we have the, the shift from enrichment to remote learning. And as Dr. Berto said, that's not synonymous with online learning. So our goals this week are really to provide the professional development we need for teachers to make that happen. For example, our elementary teachers will be using our uh, learning management system, FPS Online Classroom. That has been used for certain specific purposes in certain specific grades, but not universally. So we want to make sure that all teachers are comfortable delivering um, instruction and activities through that platform. Uh, the middle school and high school will mainly be using Microsoft Teams, although other things will be um, happening as well. We will continue to collaborate. And one of our huge goals for this week is to determine realistic measures of student accountability. What does accountability look like in a remote learning environment? And how can we agree upon that? So for people at home, what can you expect during week three for remote learning? We're transitioning from the idea of optional activities to explicit assignments that teachers will collect and give feedback on, and we expect the quality of that work to mirror those in the classroom. So a teacher could maybe say, you know what, you might want to look at that one more time because that's not what I'm used to seeing from you. Um, and we will contact parents if we're not seeing students engage at this time. We really want this to be the week where we give everybody a chance to get up to speed, where we can really assess, was everyone able to access what we've been putting out so it's really sort of our initial rollout and as I said, the launch of our website. As we transition to next week, those assignments are not only required, but we're going to have, once we agree upon those accountability measures, those will start to be enacted. Um, teachers will continue to give feedback and we'll make adjustments to the remote learning plan based on the lessons learned this week. Everything is happening at warp speed, as I'm sure parents feel. So when I talk about this week being a transition for students, I know it's also, we all know, it's a transition for parents. And we're trying, as Dr. Berto said, to find that balance so that people do not feel overwhelmed. I think that's almost impossible. I think everybody here probably feels overwhelmed by everything that's happening. One of the things when we go ahead, um, to later in this slide presentation, we're gonna talk about parents and setting realistic expectations for themselves, letting their child know when they're available to help them. If they're working from home during the day, they might have to say, okay, Johnny, I'm gonna be available from seven to eight tonight, and that's when you can ask your questions. And we're really trying to ensure that what we are giving to students, they're able to be as independent as possible Teachers will be hosting office hours each day, one hour each day, so that students can check in and ask questions if they need that support. Um, and part of that is, is really the fine line of saying, okay, how much are we giving? So the guidance from the commissioner is it should be roughly about half of a typical school day. So for parents, that could still feel like a lot of time on learning. And it's an important message throughout this PowerPoint presentation that Families and, and children will have to make a schedule that really works for them. It's, 
I, I don't think anyone has the vision of a student sitting down and working for three hours. Sit down and work for a few minutes, have a movement break, go have a snack. There's great programming right now on WGBH and WGBHY that is, is there for educational purposes as always. Um, but it's really about staggering it to make it work for parents. Um, let me see here. There are slides here that go through what administrators' responsibilities are, student responsibilities, teacher responsibilities, and parent responsibilities. Those have a lot of information on them, and they're sort of giving you just um, sort of a, a peek behind the curtain, as Dr. Berto said, of what everyone has been doing. But I would like to just briefly touch upon the student responsibilities. I think for parents, don't underestimate what your child is capable of doing on their own. We were just talking about this with the teachers about um, keeping those high standards for work. So if I'm a, a child and I have a choice most of the time of like, you know, chilling out in the corner or doing my work, I might want to chill out in the corner. So we might have to say, okay, let's see what you actually can do and try to hold them accountable for that and see how far they can get. Again, we're trying to give them things that we're confident that they're able to do. So they need to check online for their assignments. They need to participate in their work and take it seriously. They need to take advantage of the office hours and check with their teachers. Um, our special educators are also holding those same office hours as our classroom teachers. And we need to remind them that it's not a vacation and they need to take the work seriously. They also need to remember to have a routine and get sleep and still be able to check in with their friends maybe through FaceTime or whatever because that piece of learning in school is so important and we can't duplicate it. When we shift to the slide on parent responsibilities, the only one I really want to point, well there's two to point out. Number one, check the COVID-19 website that um, was up on the screen a moment ago. Regularly we'll be changing it every day. In elementary school, it will take you right to the expectations for the week for each grade level. At the middle school, it will either take you to a teacher page where it outlines everything or the homework hub. And for the high school, it's going to take you to a document that shows what teachers are putting up in teams. It's important to note that for the high school, this is very different for them in terms of um, the way students are going to access information. We wanted to make it visible to parents. We know we're going to be relying on parents to help get students engaged. So we're working on a plan to get up a linked document, just like a Word document, where all the science teachers can put in what they're doing. That is happening right now, literally, while we're sitting here. And that should be going live at some point this week. Anything that I have not? touched, I mean, I'm going to get into meeting the needs of all students. Um, so during this out of school time, as Dr. Berto said, we are especially cognizant of students who may have differing levels of ability to actually access the learning. And as I said last week, that could be because they're English learners, that could be because they are special education students, that could be because they're students with limited access to technology. So we've been particularly concerned about those subgroups of our population. And we know there's no way to duplicate the services an L student or a special education student would typically, would typically get, but we're working hard to identify alternative methods to support students. And how can we actually do that through a remote learning model? So we're going to learn lessons as we go. We know it's not going to be perfect. We're going to see what works and what doesn't and continue to identify the best ways to support our students. So just as an aside, and on the right side of that slide, how are we supporting students? So teachers of English learners are holding weekly office hours with their students. They are checking in personally with students and families, and they are sharing the best resources they know for parents and students through the COVID-19 website. And they're already up and live, and we will continue to add. Um, our special education teachers and our liaisons are holding weekly office hours, also checking in personally with students and families. They are collaborating closely with teachers to help increase accessibility of learning opportunities. And that's going to look different at different levels and different subjects, and we're really working hard to figure that out. They're also sharing resources for students and parents through our COVID-19 website. And students with limited access to technology, as we already mentioned, we are providing one laptop per household. Um, we are also sharing resources on our COVID-19 website for free Wi-Fi um, through Comcast, and there's one other provider there. 
And we're also cognizant of providing offline opportunities for those students who remain without access. And we are in the process of creating a plan for pickup of printed materials for students. The details on that are still coming together. And if I can just interject for a moment. So the survey that we had sent out to be able to see what the um, likelihood of internet access or devices at home. Mm -hmm. So last week we had reported to you that we had had about two thirds, 66 percent of people had responded to that survey and we had a really high rate of internet access. We've now had many more families respond to that and, and currently we still have about 35 to 50 families that have not responded mm -hmm. to the survey and we're reaching out to them specifically. We're able to target who they were to see if it's a matter of not having a device or they didn't receive the email or the phone call. In some cases with the phone call, if they answered and they declined and did not want to give us access to them, th then we weren't able to get that information from them. The same as when student registration was done at the beginning of the year, if they had said that they did not want to have any kind of um, response in that mode, we weren't able to reach them that way too. So we're working really hard to narrow that down and identify um, those families. We know we have, just from the survey results now, with about 2,600 uh, responses. The margin of error on that though, if we have families that have different last names in the house, then that kind of throws that off a little bit. But at this point, um, we know we still have about 17 families that don't have internet access. We know that we have 140 families that don't have computers. Yes, they can access it on their phone if they have that, but the equity piece and the access and making sure, to Dr. Mello's point, is we need to look at those offline opportunities so that everyone has access. And that is very clearly laid out in the commissioner's recommendations and guidelines as well. And to that end, as we mentioned last week, we're also very cognizant of even if a family has a computer and has internet access, if adults in the home are working from home, if college students who are back need to attend synchronous classes, there's going to be a heavy demand on those devices. So we really are trying to um, keep, our ex keep our plan simple, keep our expectations flexible, trying to um, work with parents and with students to make this experience one that can continue learning and continue mm -hmm. connection without overly stressing people who are already stressed in this situation. Um, there are samples included in the PowerPoint of what uh, a day could look like at elementary, middle, and high school. We're going to add, those are like the, um, what the, it looks like on our website and suggestions at the high school level for how much time on each content. We're going to also add a sample schedule if parents are looking for some help in structuring the day for their students, what that could possibly look like. So we'll put up some samples of that. But the underlying message is make it your own. And if you can't, you know, do three hours of work today and you can only do one, you have the whole week to try to, you know, massage the times and get through what you can get through. And it's really important to keep that ongoing communication with teachers through email. We've been responding to parent emails. If, it's, if it seems like it's too hard or if it seems like it's too much, please reach out and share because we are going to make adjustments as we check in each week to make sure what we're doing is manageable and realistic and still meaningful for students. So at the end of the uh, presentation, and I've skipped over quite a bit, there's a lot of information in here and we can certainly go back to anything that I missed. We do have an FAQ page on there. Um, we anticipate we might have people wondering why we didn't distribute laptops to all students in our district. And as we mentioned last week, we're not a one-to-one -one district, so we don't, we don't have enough devices to distribute to every student. And some people received them, as Dr. Berto said, because of the technology survey, and they were able um, to get them. And those who we didn't hear from were still trying to contact them directly. How will students be graded under remote learning? That is a hot button question. It's being discussed, I can tell you, on a daily basis across almost every district that we've talked with. So far, the Department of Ed has strongly recommended that we, as we move into week four, there's a four missing on that slide, academic work be graded as credit, no credit, throughout the remainder of the school closure. Details regarding this will be forthcoming as more information becomes available, but as I mentioned in the meantime, teachers will be sharing their expectations and their accountability measures moving into week four. So look for updates on that at the beginning of next week, and we can probably touch upon it um, at the next school committee meeting. 
And then what happens if we don't come back after May 3rd? A lot of people are asking that question. And the reality is that none of us have a crystal ball, so we don't know what's going to happen at this time. And we will await guidance just as everyone else from the governor and the commissioner. So we've included contact information for every principal and assistant principal, director of, special, uh, director of student services, director of technology on that slide so people don't have to go out and find it on the website if people would like to contact us or ask us questions. And as always, if parents have questions, they should reach out to their child via email. One clarification is the office hour for middle and high school is really for students. That's not the parent question answer period, so they can email whenever they have a question. Um, at the elementary level, it might be the parents helping the kids ask the question at that time. And the last piece on there is just um, that the COVID-19 website will be updated daily, so please check back often. And even though there's a lot here, I'm sure we probably missed something. So if you see something that's missing or you still have a question, please reach out. Okay. Okay. So the only other part of the update is what's going to be on the website, but another communication will go out tomorrow as far as food service for other families that are in need. Mm -hmm. With um, the, the uh, United States Department of Agriculture just announced that they have, can waive restrictions before we had to look for students that were eligible. Now it can be for any student. We still have to track that information but on the thursdays where we have the pickup for families in need we'll be expanding that to to any family um, that is in need and that is show that on the where that will be on the website would that be possible mike because there is a section on there yeah, for that, that um, was my question community so how, how does a family get in touch or get right a bit you know so if we keep scrolling area. past that you'll see there's a spot for all of dr Berto's communications there are all the learning plans for the different grade levels for this current week there are the middle school learning plans keep going the high school those are not live yet but they will be our department pages all of our um, departments have really come through with so many excellent resources i will pause right there um, if the school committee remembers, we were talking about our district curriculum accommodation plan that we had just been getting ready to roll out with a video uh, because we know that these accommodations are really helpful to parents too. We decided to go ahead and launch our video up there. It's not been seen before, um, as well as our DCAP document. So that is new. Normally we would have put that out as a blast and we probably still will when yeah. things calm down, but it is there. If we keep scrolling after uh, world mm. language, technology, social I think social Brent emotional. might have a question. Brent, do you have a question? Um, sorry, I'm, I, I saw I'm not you wave, the screen. So You're I saying just, I'm sure. just needing a reminder on where this is located. Right on the homepage of Foxborough Public Schools, you'll see Foxborough COVID ID, uh, COVID-19. You just click on that big box and it will take you to the website. Thank you. Okay. Keep scrolling down. That's a great question though. I wondered if people would know to click there. No. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> we that. have some, there, so there's the community resources. So you see um, for food service, that's where uh, what Dr. Burdos is talking about, yep. about will be added, and that's where our current things are also posted, Project Bread, the YMCA, mm -hmm. and our current food service program. And another, e and another email is going out mm -hmm. directly about that for Thursday for expansion of families, too. That's great to know. Sorry, I interrupted you. Very clear. No, nope, oh, I think good, that was a good point. People need to know where to go to find out how to connect. Right. For this. And, the, and the other the other piece as far as connection connecting mm -hmm. back to although I said that we're we're really reaching out to those targeted families that have not mm -hmm. responded if we have a family that does not have um, a, com a computing device at home mm -hmm. they are to reach out to their child's teacher principal in the building mm -hmm. and go through that and we will then do what we can to be able to get a device yeah. to a student if they have the Wi-Fi access we can get a laptop for them that will be returned once, as soon as we get back to school. But we've deployed a number of laptops. And if they do not have Wi-Fi access and they do not have a laptop, Hot how spot. are we handling that? There are some resources on the site with uh, Comcast they have, um, and Verizon. There's some hotspots. Yeah, the Verizon thing is new. That's not up, but I think it's Spectrum and Comcast. Right below that food service on the website, if you scroll down, it does have mm -hmm. two free options for internet. Um, and the Verizon one we've been hearing about, and if, if we are able to get access to that, we will add that as well. And if families have a computer and internet but do not have a printer, 
or have they run don't out need of paper? A, they don't need a printer. No, they don't. No, we are working really hard okay. to make sure that I can't promise you that there's nothing in there that someone said, you know, print because I haven't looked through every single thing. But we have advised teachers uh -huh. and have really talked about, again, access and equity. That would be a challenging thing for someone to print. I do know on one of the fifth grade sites, it normally says need a copy and you click it. Yeah. So, again, if we if there is something that we need to provide a print copy of, we are working on a system mm -hmm. to make that available, yeah. a pickup system very similar to the food pickup system. Yeah. And one of the things, talking about the, the work by teachers, so because it's all you know, online and we can go through and look at all these learning plans, so even this weekend when I'm on a document, I could see students on that same document. Mm -hmm. And when I was watching a particular video by one of the teachers and when it was a matter of do I have that to print off, yeah. you know, in the teacher video, it's a matter of don't worry about that. Do it on a piece of paper. Take a picture of it and you can just, and here's how you can submit it. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of other teaching of strategies and tools that are taking place very, very quickly. And I will say I saw a video today, a seventh grade science teacher reminding their students how to log in to our virtual textbook mm -hmm. just because it's not the same when you're not in school or in it already right. it saves your information yeah. so i think if parents are seeing the plan and feeling overwhelmed i don't know how to do that i don't know how to do that mm -hmm. it's very likely that your child does know how to do that mm -hmm. and if not i do know that teachers are producing sort of support videos and figuring out how to share them. So that will help parents as well as students. So if you have a fifth grader yes. and you're having trouble getting into teams for your fifth grader yes. and you're both hitting a wall, you don't know how to do it, they can't remember how to do it. Yes. We are the here best to help. path is to contact the teacher. Correct. Okay. Email the teacher and then probably what I would presume you might get back is a video produced by Mr. Ambrosio mm -hmm. walking everybody through it because we have mm -hmm. lots of those support videos already in the queue. Yeah. And even when you're looking at, for instance, the kindergarten learning plan, and you're looking at today mm -hmm. and the story that they're reading, it really, if you have the mm -hmm. access, it's clicking and from any device that will be able to bring up the story, as an example. Yeah. Okay. I do see that on all of the sample schedules, the last thing on the things to know is you are not alone. We are all in this together. Absolutely. So I think that's what we have to keep reminding ourselves as parents that we're all in this together. And if, if you hit a wall, ask for help. Don't right. get frustrated and, you know, just set it aside and get in touch with the teacher and then you can move forward. I think this, this is the most unique situation we've ever found ourselves in because this is something that is impacting everyone equally, whether you're a celebrity out in California, whether you're you know, a politician, whether you're a parent um, that is normally a stay-at-home parent, everyone is affected in the same way where you're now faced with this dual role of you have your work responsibilities and now you have your child care and child education yes. responsibilities. So again, our sort of um, methodical easing into this is, is trying to honor how challenging that is for everybody and trying to make it so that yes, we can keep learning and it's meaningful learning, but it's not so that everyone is ready to pull their hair out because it's hard to be uh, confined in a small space with all of your loved ones, even though you love them, it's 24 seven. So if you're at home with your third grader and it's her teacher's office hours and you have a conference call and she, the third grader's upset because she can't get on with her teacher, she should contact the teacher, the parent should contact the teacher and, and say, would it be possible to get in touch with you at a different yeah. time? And or? office hour doesn't mean phone call. Office hour means email. So the email, like I said earlier, and a parent can send an email at any time. Really the middle school office hour and the high school office hour are really the times that teachers are on standby looking for that communication from students through Teams, through email, through whatever. So it is going to be, I think, a little different with elementary. And it could yeah. have been a the, video the, conference as well where they're checking in too. Yeah, it's it also be. important though that you can email at any time, but don't expect a, a teacher to respond response, five minutes right, right. at nine o'clock at night. Right, right. Um, so that's an important one. It does say yeah. in there that teachers will res be responding to emails within 24 hours, Monday through Friday. We do know that people need the weekends to try mm -hmm. and regroup so that they can have the stamina for the, it, it, you, the demands that this has put on people are so different and you'd think that it would be, oh, I'm sitting here. 
sitting is the most exhausting thing I've ever experienced on all of these calls and trying to think in this new modality and then having this call and that call and my two-year-old's running around, it's a lot. It is. It's a lot for people. So um, if they don't get back to you, you know, immediately, thank you for raising that, mm -hmm. the, the, the window is 24 hours and they're doing their best to respond. Yeah. And in the meantime, it's okay to say to your child, it's all right, we're going to work side. on math yes. when your teacher gets back to us. We're not going to worry about that now. We're going to... Why is, it, why is it math, Tina? It could, I, be, I, it could be anything. I'm just trying to put myself in the <laughs> shoes. I, I am grateful that I have older children who are able to work independently. I think, I think it, this is tough on everybody. Yes. I mean, we all know this. It's tough on every single person in, well, in the world right now, but mm -hmm. especially in our community in particular we're thinking about. But I think parents who have younger students um, who are less able to work independently, and really that's... I, I would say K through six, really. Seventh and eighth graders, they're starting to do a lot more on their own. There's a big shift, or at least I saw that with my own children. And I mean, you are the experts, I'm not. But um, for, for parents who are trying to, to keep their kids on a schedule and to keep things moving along and make sure they're learning and the kids need more help and they're trying to do their jobs mm -hmm. and um, you know run their household, make sure nobody's getting sick. It is stressful, so it is good to know that you know if, if you can't figure something out. I picked math because I still can't do the just second grade math boxes. I can't even. I don't even know what the right no, name is. That's but, okay. You know, we don't even see. Do that but you know, <laughs> I would still be telling them how to carry the one. So um, I will say you raise an interesting <laughs> point. The um, part of the our commitment to collaboration with teachers and having sort of at the elementary school these universal plans. If someone is to get ill, which is very likely that mm -hmm. someone could become ill, mm -hmm. we will be able to carry on with the plan. You know, it is possible that teachers may not be able to maintain their office that hour should know. they become mm -hmm. sick. Um, we do have, I had an example today of a teacher, a sixth grade teacher, teaching a lesson on equations and sharing it out with the whole grade. So mm -hmm. they were getting instruction through a video um, that, that was posted, not necessarily from their teacher, but it's the same content. And taking those strategies, I think, up front will be very beneficial to us should this become an issue. Thank you. And the only other thing that I'd like to say is to think about um, in the realm of a student's K-12 education, mm -hmm. this period of time, it's hopefully a six-week period of time, mm -hmm. and that um, how we handle this with our students is really, really important, and that we just need to get through it together mm -hmm. and really support each other and um, ensure that we're there for them and really this time that's very extraordinarily different than anything we've ever experienced. Yes. Bill, did you have something you wanted to? Nope. Okay, I, I, thought, you, I thought you wanted to chime in. So, um, committee, who would like to start with questions for Dr. Bairdos? I, I, um, I, I'm scrolling through the pages here mm -hmm. that are live on the mm -hmm. website. I think you touched on high school is coming. Do you want to reiterate that again? It looks like there's a lot of links and a lot of information there. Nothing is live on high school yet. Okay. They are working on a shared document because normally that is not how they communicate. Kids can go in and see everything they want. Right. The purpose of that website is to make it visible to parents. Good. So we're trying to find mm -hmm. the most efficient way to do that through a shared document. So that oh, I think it was really valuable to say because I think mm -hmm. what I just heard you say is that the kids have access to yes. much of the assignments yes. and yes. the work that the high school teachers are creating, yes. which has probably been a little par for the course for the whole year anyways they've yes. probably been doing that right but I think it's important for people to know it's just not because it's accessible there right. it's probably have, accessible the to the it. students yes they can get into Microsoft Teams but the parents cannot the kids That's access right. yes. is the same though nothing absolutely has nothing has that. changed and that is for parents got it yeah thank you for clarifying yep. that's an important question but as of today the kids were the t all of the teachers were contacting yeah so if someone's Kids are saying, I didn't hear from my no, teachers at all. From they heard. Heard. And, and the new normal moving forward while we are, you know, in this extended closure for the next several weeks is that on Mondays they can expect the communication mm -hmm. from their teachers regarding the expectations for the week. There are a couple of exceptions in world language and high school math where they may give two or three days at a time. Yeah. But it will be on a Monday. They will be turning the page. Who would like to? Did you get all your questions? That was that was where the uh, on my mind. So maybe Brent, Rob, do you have questions? I, You're good, I, Rob. I 
I do have one question, and this this came from my uh, resident high school student earlier today. Uh, uh, <laughs> looking at looking forward at the schedule and for whatever reason he didn't make the connection um that april vacation was actually included in the everything's going to be remote until may 4th um so with the, will the expectation be with these uh learning plans that we will also be working through what would typically be the uh, april vacation week a great question. That is a great question, and it is the question that we're all talking about. Okay. So let me answer it in a couple of different ways, and in the end, I'm not really going to answer it. <laughs> so we have heard um, that the commissioner is going to be giving us guidance on that this week. We're hoping it's in the next couple of days. What it comes down to is we do know that we have to go to our 185th day, and that 185th day takes into account that we have April vacation. So if we go forward and we're not um, here, April vacation, if you will, then our last day of school would be June 23rd, which is the 185th day. However, if we decide to give up April vacation, if you will, and those we not to lose the momentum and continue to go forward with remote learning, then our last day of school would be June 17th. So then the question becomes, do we take April vacation um, or do we continue to move forward? And the reason that we don't have an answer for that right now is because if we are back on May 4th, mm -hmm. then we absolutely prefer face-to-face -face with our students. That is advantageous for us. So taking April vacation, then we would have more face-to-face -face time with our students. However, if we find out closer to that time that we would have an extension to where, let's say it went to the end of the year, then to lose that time, we would lose that momentum with remote learning and it would be more advantageous to not give up April vacation and to continue through. So you can't really come up with a, an answer right now, I don't believe, because we want to really see if we're back on May 4th or if it's extended longer. Oh, makes sense. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Debbie, do you have any questions on the update no. and the remote learning plan? It's amazing what's been done. And the accessibility we've been making for everything. It's you. been a Herculean effort by a lot of people, and they are all to be commended for their That's efforts. That's an understatement. Absolutely. Uh, the, they're extensive. What, 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 you, what you've done is extensive already. And I, I would also venture a huge thanks to the teachers and all the yes. work they've done up to this point. Yes. So this is, it, this is Herculean effort to put this together in a website accessible by all. We can all see it. But that did not just happen in 10 days. No. Uh, the, the information that goes into that, what's behind that, is um, to the credit of what our teachers are doing every day, I would, I would venture. Um, they have a high level of technology involved anyways and how they put their plans together and how they put things out there already. So, you know, I think it was great effort to get to this too, but thank you for their efforts up to this point as well. And I think it speaks to the pride that they take in yes. their work and the pride that they take in their district and their responsibility. We've really seen that. It's just people not willing to lower their standard of work even though there are different constraints that are making it challenging. It has been really impressive. Yeah. And one of the other things that happened today from our technology department as an example, so they're working so hard to be able to support <laughs> teachers with new strategies and tools that they haven't used in the past, but then at the same time, teachers' files on their computers at school are all on the network. So they didn't have remote access to network files. That went live today, and now teachers are able to access all of their network files. So that, that's huge when you think about the curriculum and all of the things that are in the classroom that they can't get to. So I know we didn't go over every single thing that is on all of the slides, and I just want to suggest to folks who are watching at home that you do go on the website and read the slides because there is so much information here that will answer a lot of questions. And then if you have further questions, you know the people you need to ask those questions of, and they will get you the answers. Um, I did have a question. I was, I was curious um, how we are connecting with our students in the uh, METCO program. 
is Jacinia in touch with all of them? I'm, yes. I'm assuming everyone, she is. Absolutely. But. She's been she's been down mm -hmm. twice to pick up laptops actually. Yeah. And has delivered laptops to students that needed them. Mm -hmm because they don't have the access to get here to pick them up. And she's in touch with every one of the families mm -hmm. daily, mm -hmm. as well as all of the teachers are in touch with their students as well. Good, that's great. I, I assumed as much, but I wanted to tie that <laughs> knot. Yeah. Um, okay. Can I just add one more thing Please. that's coming? Yeah. Um, tomorrow, hopefully, we will also be putting up a schedule <laughs> of the teacher's office hours mm -hmm. so that parents can quickly go onto the website and see all in one spot mm -hmm. who has what office hours when. Um, and the beauty of that website is we're able to change it at any time. So if someone should become ill, we can put a notification there so that people will know. Well, that's good. And that's, that's for guidance counselors. It's yeah, for everybody. everybody. Yeah. Wonderful. OK, um, because we are. Oh, I'm sorry, Brent. Didn't say, you're back up. <laughs> yes, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll hear me? You're up. Okay, um, and forgive me if I missed it, uh, um, Amy and Allison. Uh, is there uh, discussions in the works, or has it been decided uh, about end of term date, or is that TBD? The the term for term three will close on Friday, April the third. That that will stay. Okay. Yeah. And as Thank far you. as what fourth term looks like and the credit versus no credit, we're still working all of that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, Brent, nope. in that regard? You actually anticipated one of um, our, our only public comment that was emailed in for the open right. public comment period uh, was from Joseph Garrity. And um, I'll just read his email. Uh, here's my public comment for the school committee meeting on Monday, 3-30-20. One, as we don't go back to school now until Monday, May 4th, and we do not go to school on Good Friday of 4 10 20 with the last day of school for Foxborough Public School be Tuesday, June 23rd, or Wednesday, June 24th on the fifth cancellation day. And uh, I think, Dr. Bairdos, you've already addressed that issue. And well, and we, <laughs> on that Good Friday holiday, we, that is a day of school for us this yes. year. It's a real yeah, early that's, release, that, but that's still was my, a day. That is my. Um, recollection as well. And his second question is for the terms three and four at the middle and high school level, would term three end at 30 days, which would be uh, in, um, in term from 1-27-20 to 3-13-20. So it ends term this coming Term Friday. three ends on yeah. Friday, April And 30. term four would end whenever we were returned to school like May 4th. Until, so I think we've addressed both of Joe's questions. And we welcome anyone who, um, during this during this time of public health crisis with limiting um, public in-person participation, we'll continue with um, getting open public comment through our school committee inbox or if anyone wanted to leave a message at the central office. So we're gonna continue this way until the social distancing is lifted. And that is compliant with the um, open meeting law I did check with Glenn Kucher at MASC to make yes. sure that last week, before we did this last week, to make sure we were proceeding, you know, in an appropriate manner. And Glenn assured us that we were. So um, next up on our agenda, we do have some basic um, uh, housekeeping matters to attend to. We have our executive session meeting minutes from March 2nd um, to approve and approve for release, hopefully. Um, does anyone have any changes to the uh, March 2nd, 2020 executive session meeting minutes? Would anyone like to make a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you, I'll second. Thank you, Richard. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor of approving the executive session meeting minutes? Rob, you with us? <laughs> Thanks, five zero zero. Okay, would anyone like to make a motion to release these meeting minutes? So moved to Thank release these sorry. minutes. Any further discussion? All those in favor of releasing our executive session minutes, Aye. five zero zero. Okay, thank you. And we have our regular meeting minutes from March 2nd, and I was reading through them. I have no changes, but I was thinking to myself as I read through the meeting minutes from March 2nd, when we went over, um, what your challenges were in your <laughs> mid-cycle review. Those were very valid and, and things we were working hard at and definite challenges, but nothing compared to what 
we have gone through in the last three weeks and what we're okay. facing the next, well, the, the rest of the school year. So. Correct. So there you go. Um, that's just an aside comment. But as far as any changes, does anyone have any changes to the March 2nd regular meeting minutes? No. no. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve said minutes? One of you would like to do it? I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes from the March 2nd uh, meeting. Thank you, second. Rob. Brent Rob seconded. and Brent seconded. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Five zero zero, And we have our special meeting minutes from last week um, that Janet put together from the video. I didn't have any changes to these. Does anyone have any additions or Just changes? Had, I had a couple of yeah. points. So mm -hmm. on the second paragraph under COVID-19 update, yep. where it says in the last second to last sentence, a recent survey found that 98.5% of our families have Wi-Fi access. Mm -hmm. I think that that needs to be quantified out of the 66% that had responded. Okay. Yeah. 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 That, that's that's well a good done. point. Yeah, that's I, well done. That that is a good catch actually. And then. So. Um, so make, we'll make that change. Okay, and then I had a second one under the open public comment. Yes. The second paragraph, which has to do with the first um, sentence. And this one, I really wasn't sure exactly how to word it. And, mm -hmm. and it may be okay. I wanted to get the committee's thoughts on this, okay. where it says um, the school calendar will not include 180 days this year. It was really more about the curriculum with 180 days worth of curriculum. Right. We're still going to have students with 180 days, days, although they may not be here physically in right. class, so it may need to say in class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, I think that's a good okay. adjustment, to be clear. Do you all agree? Yes. Okay, well with those two changes, um, would someone like to make a motion to approve these minutes? Brent, go ahead. <laughs> Sure, uh, I move to approve the March 23rd, uh, 2020 minutes with the uh, two adjustments stated. Thank you. Second? Second. I'll Thank second that. Thank you, Rob. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approving the March 23rd meeting minutes? It's 500. Zero, zero. And with many extra thanks <clears throat> yes. to Janet Grazier. For Absolutely. Her Good job. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Extrapolating our <laughs> yes. A many thanks to our our hardworking staff in all of the buildings and the central office. Every there's so much going on behind the scenes to keep everything you know running. Everyone paid. Um, all of the you know facilities kept up, clean everything. So everyone's working very hard during this time. <clears throat> okay. So the next item on our agenda is our proposed 2020-2021 school committee meeting dates. We're just trying to clean up a couple housekeeping things here and um, we generally approve our meeting uh, dates this time of the year. Um, this is our traditional first Monday, third Monday schedule. Uh, we could decide, we have a couple meetings that end up going back to back. We could decide to move them now. We could see where we are. Um, those would be January, February, and February, March. Um, it's really up to all of you. If you just want to approve our regular schedule and then take it as it comes as we get closer to those dates, we can do that. Or we can decide to shift on the calendar now. Uh, so I, <clears throat> past experience, we usually have voted in yes. this, this new one at this point. Yeah. And then we have to massage it depending on where we're at. Where we're at, and this year has us all off. Well, right now we're meeting weekly, extra. So. <laughs> <laughs> which is three, appropriate. Three but it's um, row, yeah. So. Just wanted to put it out there, gentlemen. Yeah, I think it's wise to approve it as is okay. for now, and then we can we can adjust it as we get close. Yeah, that's why that. I would sure. like to make a motion that we adjust the uh, we approve it. Yeah, twenty. Uh, 2020 21 school committee meetings as presented okay. uh, with changes as necessitates. I'll second that. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? That's 500, zero, zero, and thank you, Janet, for putting together the schedule for us. All right. Our other, um, it's not really housekeeping, but it is something that we must do by. 
um, June 1st every year, and that is have our annual vote on school choice. Um, you have our, our current policy in your school committee packets and also the statutory basis um, for the school choice law. Uh, every year, actually by May 1st of every year, we need to, um, well by June 1st, we have to have our vote. By May 1st, if we decide to go forward, the administration has to determine the number of spaces, et cetera. But we have, as a district in Foxborough, never been a, a choice dis district. Um, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Beardos on this? Why is that? Why is that that we've not been a school choice district? Yeah. One, we are, we feel as though that our students, we have plenty of students in our current uh, classes and mm -hmm. uh, the districts that bring in students for school choice, many times they're doing that because maybe their enrollment is really declining to a point that they needed to be able to sustain their district. A few years back, I think it was two years ago, yeah. we, we really went back and looked at that to find out the districts that had done that mm -hmm. and what were the reasons for that and it was really to be able to continue as a school district because without that they would not have been able to sustain their district and then at the same time with bringing in students for um, their budget to help with the overall budget. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other issue was that once you accept the school choice, um, the children that you bring in that year are guaranteed their 12 years, depending on where they come in. Um, so even if you elected to go away from it two years later, someone who came in at first grade is gonna go all the way through 12th grade um, as a requirement mm -hmm. of the law. Well, good questions, definitely. Anything else? <clears throat> Any other thoughts? Did we lose? And has there, I'm also curious, um, given that, uh, you know, we just went through the budget vote and all that, given that enrollment is a bit down in within this, within the kind of the natural cycle as, as uh, uh, Bill was so good to explain the historical data, whatever, three, four meetings ago, um, is that something that anybody would like to discuss further? Well, I, I think from the financial approach, um, if we were to open it up and, and um, receive any kind of account, now obviously you can set your limits uh, of how many kids you're willing to take um, by grade level. Uh, but the way we've got it structured right now, we have structured our class size and our number of teachers based on our current counts. So if we were to open it up and all of a sudden get, you know, bring in, um, additional kids, we would have to limit it so that we wouldn't have to add additional teachers uh, in any given area. And as you know, we've cut back um, right. in the elementaries, the middle schools, uh, and so on, and basically feel that our, our class sizes now are appropriate based on the teaching base that we have. Um, if we felt that we were low in our numbers with the teaching staff, then that would be a good reason to, to, to try to push for it. But mm -hmm. we took the tack of reducing our teaching numbers versus uh, looking to bring more kids in. We do not have to, I mean, we don't have to vote on this tonight. We have time if, if the members need more time to reflect on, on whether um, to continue our current policy or, um, you know, go in a different direction. This is, this, we can vote, we can vote on it tonight, but we could continue this to, you know, in the next meeting if, if you want to think about it some more. I have no issue voting on this tonight. We've built a budget and structured a budget without offering extra places and spots for other students outside of our community. Mm -hmm. I'm very comfortable supporting this community and where we sit right now with no school choice. I would say we vote on it today. I agree, but I just wanted to make it clear that we do have a I little mean, time. We have at this. We've point. let p teachers go because mm -hmm. to to fit our enrollment. Absolutely. We fine tuned, you know, to the tenths and Absolutely. all through so high school and I everywhere. Be, so I would be comfortable in voting for this tonight. Okay. Yeah, I would think so. Or on this issue is what I mean to say. Would one of you like to make a motion to continue our current policy of not admitting non-resident students? I would be happy to make that motion to continue our policy to not admit non-resident students to the Foxborough Public Schools. I'd like to second that. Is there any further discussion? Gentlemen? At home? I'm trying to make sure. Brent, can you hear us? 
Yes, I can. Okay. I'm, I'm fine. I would like to, I'm fine voting on this now, given uh, what Bill and Rich have said. I would okay. invite us to discuss this policy earlier next year. Uh, as we are considering I will count on you to bring that up earlier next year so that it gets on an earlier agenda and we can have that conversation maybe more during our budget um, a preliminary budget process when we're looking at enrollments and budgets and so forth okay all right we have a motion we have a second we've had our um, any further discussion so all those in favor of the motion to not um, have school choice is three Three and four and Brent five. Okay, five zero zero. Thank you. All right, so we are at other matters and there's so much going on. Um, <laughs> I don't even know where to start. Bill, could you give us in, in all of the um, COVID-19 uh, in addressing all of the COVID-19 matters, we kind of um, we also have been pursuing, we had the uh, CIP meeting, and we also, it seems like a long time ago, but on March 11th, we were in front of the advisory committee and they took their vote on our proposed budget. So would you like to update the community on where we're at with those two things? Yeah, well, the, the advisory committee did vote to uh, approve the school budget as Present. uh, presented. Um, Obviously, they had a lot of questions. I thought they were very thoughtful on their presentation of, of what their concerns were. Um, and I hopefully feel that we did answer the questions um, that they rose. The CIP committee, um, that was a much tougher issue because of the limited funding uh, for the CIP budget this year. Um, and so there were, an, um, in our case, uh, we were looking for three buses, which is part of our rotation. Um, we had to back off of one um, to make it work. We also unfortunately had to back off on the music uh, instruments um, mm -hmm. just because it's just not enough money out there based on the needs from the other departments as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you know we, we, we did push forward with uh, our technology mm -hmm. um, request. Uh, that was approved um, at the 200,000 level. The, like I said, one full-size bus, one mini bus was approved. Uh, our copiers were approved. Um, and I think I'm missing one thing. Um, the buses, the copiers, music was no. Yeah. So I guess that's a, Technology, those I think that's separate. it, yep. Um, so I, I think we're, you know, we're in fairly decent shape at this point. I don't believe the Board of Selectmen have made their final um, Approvals yet, but I'm not positive. Tomorrow on that. night, actually. Okay. I, well, I, um, I don't know about the budget tomorrow, but tomorrow the Board of Selectmen is going to address whether um, town meeting and our town elections will be moved. So that might impact when they make their final determinations. Right. On the the um, one of the other things I wanted to to raise, um, mm -hmm. if this is the appropriate time. So, Bill. Um, Bill yep. I'm I'm sorry. I just have one question. Um, I don't remember. Um, whether it was part part of this year's music budget or one of the the, the three year, if I think if it was um, the risers, which do see to be seem to be a safety issue, so those were not included in the CIP. They were they, uh, they were in the request for the CIP, the uh, seventy five thousand request this year, uh, and those were not funded. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on that area? So one of the other financial things that we're facing um, is basically dealing with uh, vendor payments um, during this shutdown. Mm -hmm. And uh, the state has been very clear in their process uh, looking, um, you know, especially, and, and, and actually if you read the uh, $2.2 trillion dollar, um, requirement for municipalities to receive any of the money they have to continue to move forward with payments to uh, staff and vendors um, and they're kind of specific on that unfortunately state law stipulates that we cannot pay for services not rendered um, the only way around that is um, basically having a an amendment to certain contracts and, and the one i'll give you up front which is Fortunately for us, we have our own bus, uh, bus service, so we don't, we're not dependent upon an outside service group, which um, 
is is a real big diff, you know big uh, problem for a number of the districts right now because they're all looking for the towns to pay them the money to keep them in business effectively. Our only one on that uh, side is part of our BICO uh, collaboration, and that is that we have a uh, our auto district transportation uh, for our special needs program. Uh, basically, we have you know. Um, gathered about 25 different communities together. We have about a four and a half million dollar um, vendor uh, contract uh, with Vanpool. And all the guidance we've been given so far is to basically negotiate with the outside contractor a reduced rate because obviously they're not incurring certain costs. They're not putting fuel in vehicles. They're not doing repair and maintenance. Um, and they might not be paying staff. Um, so that's something we'd have to find out. But would be to create an amendment uh, to the contract just for the period that we're under uh, suspension of services uh, for COVID-19 um, that would be agreed to by the BICO Collaborative, which we are a hmm. member of, um, and therefore attached to the contract and therefore would allow us through state law to make those payments. Mm -hmm. um, I've been asked to sit on that um, negotiations committee, but quite honestly, I'm only going to do it if this committee is willing to uh, understand and agree that we are willing to be part of that negotiations um, and that we understand, that, you know, from my perspective as the business manager, the biggest issue we face is we, um, there are very few options for these type of carriers. Mm -hmm. um, and especially when you look at the, the size of us uh, as a group, um, like I said, 25 communities, four and a half million dollars um, in, in services. Um, if they go out of business because they still have lease payments, they still have insurance payments, they still have their basic cost, um, we will have no place to go um, to service our kids. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the guidance that came down, if you think about it, is very similar to what the guidance that they're saying is if you are a member of the BICO Collaborative, they are just an extension of us. Mm -hmm. They are you know, just like our classroom teachers. Um, they are producing uh, for our students that go to them, just like our teachers are producing for the students that are here in the Foxborough School District. Um, so, you know, they are extending that same concept to saying that if you have an arrangement like this, if you can negotiate a better rate for the period of time um, and and hopefully keep them in business, again, part of our potential for any kind of um, state aid is based on us doing this type of an action. Um, but uh, from my perspective, I can only pay these bills uh, legally if I have an amendment that says that it's been negotiated and it's part of the contract. Some of the big bus contracts actually say they get paid for 180 days, whether you're in school or not. Mm. It's an it's interesting clause. I don't think they ever thought about it for this reason, but they had it for other reasons. Snow days, I'm sure, were part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in this particular case, if this committee is, is willing to entertain that negotiations, then, then I will sit on that committee and, and, and try to hatch that out um, for the other 25 districts that are involved. Vanpool does a lot of other towns outside of our collaborative yeah. as well. So they're a very large uh, producer, but really in, in this part of the uh, state, there's only two or three of them that mm -hmm. are of that size and they're all facing the exact same issues. So So you need a motion from us. Well, I, 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 I don't know if I need a motion, but I need a consensus that, the, a consensus. that the committee is, understands why we're doing this and what the issues are for it um, and mm -hmm. why we would you know, continue to uh, pay for them when they are out of service. We're effectively paying for for the the cost that they've committed to us as a community, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, to service our needs. Um, we wouldn't be paying again for fuel if they did lay off their staff. We would not be paying for that. Um, so that's where the negotiation would come into play. Mm -hmm. Give me wise. Yeah, it does sound wise to me. I think it sounds very wise to do that. <clears throat> we, we need those services. Yeah. We absolutely absolutely need those services. Agreed. Our budget is based on some need for special needs at a very high level mm -hmm. already to not guarantee those services which are actually very economically sound and, and very prudent it would be crazy for us not to be part of it so well said Richard be very wise to maintain I would in some manner I really do don't that. think we have a question oh. of what to do or not to do so I, I'm in full support of you going into negotiations agreed Gentlemen? agreed Brent says agreed Rob are you in consensus with us as well or I Yes. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. It's, it's a little, it is a little <laughs> awkward trying to, I mean, to, 
to make sure our, our remote participants are, are accounted for over there. So, all right, well, I think you have, and I, I agree as well, I think you have consensus to move forward <coughs> and we'll look forward to an update on that down the road. Yes. Yeah, probably within the next couple of weeks. Yeah, we need to do this fairly quickly. Yeah, I would think so. I would think so. Um, Amy? Thank you, Bill. I don't have anything else. I know Allison <clears throat> does, though. So before we move on, I did, you and I had a conversation or we texted yesterday about um, some PPE that the school department was able to make available to our first responders. Yes. Um, I just wanted to. Thank you for reminding me of that. So when we think about the things that we have in our schools that we could possibly donate to help out with our first responders. We donated over three cases of masks to our first responders. We've also donated our, our quick read thermometers to the Y to be able to quickly read for temperatures where they're- The daycare. The daycare there. So um, any of the things that we could donate, we're doing that. And um, I don't know if there's anything else that I've missed as far as- no, I mean, obviously, we are one facilities department, so we obviously are doing what we can as far as any other uh, mm -hmm. products that we have um, to put within their facilities to, to make it so that they can keep them clean and, and disinfected. So um, they are our front line. We can't afford to lose them. So. 100%. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Allison. Uh, as you know, we have two searches underway, one for the Igo Elementary School principal and one for the director of student services. Director of Student Services was reposted, and the team is convening tomorrow night for the next step of narrowing down who they would like to interview. We anticipate those interviews happening in short order. After that, we really want to keep our process moving. Mm -hmm. And for the IGO principal, the team has narrowed it down to two finalists, and we had a good discussion about what that would look like in terms of the next step would normally be a site visit right. where parents and staff could interact with the mm -hmm. candidates. And um, we're thinking that we're going to be able to do that virtually through okay. the Zoom platform. Mm -hmm. So parents should watch for communication on that probably tomorrow. I, I, go, when parents. The, I go parents. Yeah. And I, I, I would hope that it could, be, normally we wouldn't say on a Monday we want to do it within the same week, but where everybody is home <laughs> and we're ready, um, we're going to try to do it later this week. Okay. So yes. keep, and where will that communication, that will go out as a blast to I go parents. It they don't have to. Go on no, and they, look for good anything. This point. one's going to yes. come out. This one's going to come just to them. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Well, it, there is a lot of information. So much. That we are both no, I'm so glad you said that. Absorbing. Yes, so. and and it's only the Igo parents. So yes, thank you for that. No, well, thank you for continuing to um, pursue both searches, even while going forward with all of these other um, detours to our education. It's <laughs> a good word <laughs> right now, Richard. Oh, Richard, actually, I'm going to put you on the spot again. I know. Sports, I, I pulled it up sports. right here just so I, I would have it. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is a very pressing question for, for a lot of our, well, for all of our student athletes and their families yeah. as well as us. So the MIA Board of Directors met today, and our Board of Directors is the decision maker for the association for all the member schools. So they were considering a lot of the actions for a tournament play going forward. Um, so it's been tweeted out what they did, but their motions were relatively clear that the season wouldn't begin no earlier than May 4th, mm -hmm. uh, at the very earliest. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the conditions that is involved in spring sports is when students can start to have competition once the season is opened. So that is a decision that needs to be made by the board of directors. Mm -hmm. So like rugby needs nine days of training, physical training for the rugby schools to properly be fit to perform on the 10th day. Mm -hmm. And so they, and those rules are very clear that it used to be in the, in the rule book, it says 10 days of training and you can't play until the 11th. So the board waived that to make it uh, seven days of training mm -hmm. so they could start on the eighth day. So given that May 4th would be a Monday, seven calendar days, including the May, May 4th Monday would take you through Sunday of practices. Your first comp, the first competition could be the following Monday. Mm -hmm. um, they also set limits on the season of how many, uh, competitions minimum and maximum because uh, many of the sports have maximums 20 20 games in baseball and softball um, I think it's 16 or 18 in lacrosse so they did set maximums which are basically calendar driven mm -hmm. how much time do you have to play those games to qualify so they set maximums I believe of 12 uh, games and a minimum of eight um, they are still right now the board is still hopeful that a tournament may be possible uh, the board of directors is made up of athletic directors and principals, so they all put input into this saying that, 
you know, our students want to play in some capacity across the state. It doesn't have to be a, a tournament necessarily, but they would like some season play, would like something to take away. So the tournament hope is still possible. They did not formalize what that would look like. It would have to be a reduced length of tournament. Um, so there could be some challenges there. And our sports are different enough mm -hmm. that it that will play out differently. Track is very different than baseball and softball and lacrosse when you have to bracket out the competition in a tournament. Where track, you might be able to do something like indoor, where Division One just goes here on a day and they perform. So you have to take all those considerations. But the end dates are also important to the, to the, to the decision. Mm -hmm. So they did push it out to have possibilities up through June 27th for tournament uh, play as well as some season play. Another decision they made, which might go unnoticed, but I think is an important one to point out um, that I was able to pick on, is they did vote that um, the participation is extended for all teams and all levels through June 27. And that's an important distinction because normally in the, in the way the MIA plays it out, once tournament begins, all other play must stop. Mm -hmm. So you, you can't play beyond that, really. Mm -hmm. um, but this they extended it to allow certain things to happen. So I think the consideration is that there are some teams that won't make tournament. And if a tournament is smaller and it's more exclusive as opposed to inclusive, then there could be some teams that just, you know, just have some more days they could play out their, their season schedule. Mm -hmm. So it does allow play up through June 27th. Rain date of June 28th, which is the Sunday. Usually we stop on Saturdays, so it allows for the rain date. And I think that's, oh, the only other thing that was up, up for discussion was the physicals. Um, it's another big deal, too. Physicals have to be done within the 13-month period. That's the DPH regulation as well. So they did, they did use the dates of, uh, if a physical was up to date on March 13th, mm -hmm. uh, 2020, that would allow them to play. Or if it needed to have a virtual phys phys physical or physician's note, giving permission to the student athlete to participate if it's received between March 14 and May 4. That would also be acceptable. It was a big concern for the schools mm -hmm. that sometimes their physicals are March 13 mm -hmm. and the, everything got shut down on, on everyone. So, so that, was the, that was a key to get that done too. So I, I think the effort was to, to put a season in, play, in place mm -hmm. as far as possible. Um, I think the board was wise not to go much further than June 27th. Um, there are some states in the country that are now talking about the summer. I think Connecticut is even starting to have conversations. And uh, I, I can say from my opinion, and I'm, I'm not a voting member of the board, <laughs> uh, squeaking into July could be very complex for schools uh, to, to go any further than June 27. That date of June 27 is probably the latest we've ever had tournament games. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be an issue just from a financial perspective? Because I can't pay a coach into the next year on this year's budget. For, I, for July, if, right. if we were to go into July, I, yeah, that's a good point. I, I would think so too. I, I would. I, I can. One thing the board probably wouldn't do, though, which is typical of the MIA board, is that they don't have control of the budgeting and they don't pay any of the employees. Mm -hmm. So they would try to set the parameters that made sense to us all, but they don't have control over that either, and they can't necessarily pass judgment. But I think I agree with you. I think the wisdom of the board, and it's all principals and ads, they know the same. Um, besides paying. They're not working either. So, I mean, I think I, I can't imagine them ever going beyond June 27th. How would that play out if our last day of school was prior to June 27th? How would it play? How, how, how does that play out? It, you know, I would say the feel of it would be no different than like seniors. Okay. Right? Our seniors always leave on June 3rd, June 4th. Okay. And if you're in a That's state a, level yeah. tournament, you play every senior plays mm -hmm. two weeks beyond That's graduation. Yeah. Um, so so I think, I think this, it would be the same feel. You know, right. um, and once Good. you do that. So, again, depending how late sports start, you know, it could just be a, a, a league. It could mm -hmm. be a league schedule, and that's mm -hmm. all she wrote, you mm -hmm. know, and, or could have a tournament in. So we'll see. We'll see. Thank you, Richard, for the explanation. Really, really appreciate it. I have yes. a question. The other night, it made me question when I saw this on the television the other night. But in Woburn, Massachusetts, the coach, I think it's of the lacrosse team, the coach has half a team coming in to uh, practice and then another half a team because they're, you know, at distance with that sport. Are there other high schools that are running practices? I, I don't think so. The, the, the conversation came up, came up today at the board meeting about out-of-season coaching because there are very clear parameters for out-of-season coaching. Um, and, and I think the discussion, they, they took no action on that, so let me just say that. They took no action on making an out-of-season decision at all. They may do it at a future meeting, whenever that might be. 
So right at this point, everything is, is a stay. Out of season coaching is out of season coaching. Um, but are there, are there sc high schools doing that? I, I, I would think not. They should not be. Um, but, well, that's, that's why I was, I was very surprised to they were interviewing some of the players on the on the yeah. television. Well, in all yeah. of our fields and 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 uh, play, playgrounds, everything is closed. Well, I but I that's why I was so surprised. So I'm wondering. It, it shouldn't be happening, and and any time in the association, if someone you know has run afoul of that, they can be they're a self-reporting association. Mm -hmm. So you know it, it could be, could have been a mistake. It could be a misrepresentation, for all we know. Um, I know all the out-of-season coaching people are very strong on it to make sure that that uh, coaches don't um, uh, unintentionally coerce players into doing things as required by a coach out of season. Right. So that's that's the whole out-of-season coaching, you know. Uh, idea, just, but, it, yeah. I raised my eyebrows as I was watching yeah. it. But, but on the flip side, the people are some people are advocating for because if we're talking about um, trying to engage students in productive manners, can coaches talk to players about what is wise to do or things like that? So no decision at this point. So I think everyone should steer clear of it for right now and let it be. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Brent, Rob, do you have anything to add for other matters? All set? Okay. I'm good, thank you. When's the next meeting? Are we meeting again so next? So we are yeah. meeting. That's sorry. a sorry. I valid didn't mean to take it. No. I'm sorry. I apologize. No, that's a valid question. So we actually do have a meeting scheduled for next Monday. And I which think, is our regular meeting. Which is our regular meeting, but it will not be in our regular location because our buildings are still closed. So we will be here next Monday. And, and remote. I, I, and anyone who wants to be remote, if anyone's, um, you know, they keep saying that things could get pretty um, difficult. Uh, from a, a positive perspective from uh, uh, if anyone prefers to be at home that's we we will work it out it's Mike's working hard back there in the the video room and our, our remote participation is working I think just fine right guys good all good so um, anyone who wants to participate remotely we will have the zoom link and uh, we can do that right now we have this meeting room booked and I think we are all appropriately spaced and, and practicing good social distancing. So we'll plan to be here next Monday at 7. Um, I think given the rapidly evolving nature, we still have some things. I know you sent out um, today the commissioner's um, letter to, to parents, and uh, it was very informative, but there were still a lot of questions, like MCAS, for example, yes. is one of them. And um, you know, I think we will know more next Monday so I think it is beneficial to get together and and hear what is what has gone on and and what will yeah. be going on things are definitely changing yeah. day by day and weekly for sure so um, we have a meeting scheduled for next week and then we will we will see where we're at next Monday um, before we conclude you know I wanted to say uh, last year uh, I, there were so many good things going on in our community and people treating each other with grace and kindness and patience. And I, I hope we see so much more of that going forward in what is going to be a, a fairly difficult and stressful um, month. And I think it was last year or the year before, but the sign at the IGO said, be the rainbow in someone's cloud. So I, I hope that we can all be the rainbow in someone's cloud going forward and um, look out for one another and remember that we are all in this together so Absolutely. that being said would anyone like to make a motion to adjourn this meeting gentlemen anyone <laughs> i feel like i'm in ferris bueller's day off bueller anyone want to make a motion to adjourn i will motion that we adjourn this meeting thank you rob canfield i'll second it excellent all those in favor of adjournment Five zero zero. Good night, everybody. Good night, remote guys. <laughs>